So the title of my talk tonight is Being, Good. Being You. And I want to start with a story. Um, actually, it's an autobiographical story about myself. And when I was a teen, a young teen, um, one of my favorite authors was Sally Benson. Sally wrote um, books for teenage girls, and she told them what it was for a teenage girl to have a good personality. And I was really into this. A good, per a good personality was a someone who was popular. That was number one. And to be popular, you needed to um, be enthusiastic and peppy and outgoing. And uh, if you made good grades, that was a good thing. But it wasn't seem, didn't seem to be the top thing. And to be kind of, I guess you'd say, the cheerleader type. And this, her, her writing was, I think, the most influential of all the books when I was a young teen. Um, I spent a lot of time thinking about what a good personality was and trying to have one and talking with my friends as teenage girls will. You know, at length we examined a good personality. And the upshot was is that I um, did become a cheerleader in junior high school as well as in high school. And, um, you know, I thought, wow, I'm on my way to having a good personality. Um, and I have to say I loved being a cheerleader on one hand because first of all, I had a lot of energy. I was enthusiastic. And you know, and all that, uh, and I actually rather liked the status, you know, on the day of the games, you wore the sweaters with a big letter on it. That was nice. Uh, and then you get, and you're out there jumping out around in front of everybody, and everybody's cheering, and the sympathetic nervous system is going big time, and you're shouting, and wow, that's a real high. Now, the only problem with all of that was, that um, I'm an introvert, still am. <laughs> so um, on times when I wasn't actually out there cheering and doing cheerleading, you know, when my sympathetic nervous system kind of kicked in in more of my normal mode, I thought, this is such a silly thing. You know, I thought cheerleading was silly, you know, and I felt embarrassed that I was doing it. Now, not embarrassed enough to leave the squad, I will say that, but I felt embarrassed by the fact that I was doing it. Um, and in later years, I thought, oh, you know, I think I'll write a book called The Angst of a High School Cheerleader. <laughs> I never did it, but, you know, it seemed like it was a good thing. I certainly spent enough time worrying over it. Um, now, I think that um, tonight I want to talk about this pull that we all experience to fit in, because that's what I was doing as a cheerleader, is I wanted to fit in. And I think all societies have that. Their norms, the things that are considered the way to be, and whatever they are, different times, we try to fit in. And I want to affirm that, first of all, it's normal to try to fit in. Uh, and whoever you are, to also affirm that it is okay to be just who you are, even if you don't quite fit in, which I felt I actually didn't. I felt a little, I felt quite inauthentic up there as a cheerleader. It's okay if you don't fit in. And I want to take a look tonight at this pool. What is it to be authentic, to be you? It's okay to be you. And I want to see it in a spiritual context, in the context of our spiritual practice as well. And first I'll say that as I just did, I'm an introvert. And we know in our culture, it's really the um, ideal, basic, <coughs> basically in our culture, is an extrovert. Is that not so? I think we've all kind of recognized it. The outgoing, the person who is persuasive and has a good personality and so forth. An introvert, by definition, is a person who draws their energy from solitude or being alone. They work best often on their own. 
They may be shy or they may not be shy. That's not the definition. It's where you are energized. And an an introvert is energized by being alone. An extrovert, on the other hand, is energized by being with people and speaking. There's no right. There's no wrong. It's not a matter of right and wrong. It's just two different personality styles. An introvert, as I said, learns best alone. An extrovert can often learn best in a team format and with others and through others. And I will just mention there's a wonderful book out if anybody is interested in this subject of introverts versus extroverts. It's called Quiet by a woman named Susan Cain. Quiet, the power of introverts in a world that can't stop talking. Yeah. It sounds like it's a criticism of extroverts, but it's not really. She's just really focusing. What's the difference? So uh, that is one way that we can feel pulled, as I did as a teen, to fit in, to try to be an extrovert. I didn't quite fit in. But you know what? And I'm mentioning this in particular because I know so many, that many meditators are introverts, not everybody. And as I said, there's no right or wrong, but I think it, and because I am one too, I felt like, oh, I would like to talk about it a little bit. But I think there are other poles in our society, other ways where we can try to fit in and maybe we're not feeling entirely uh, authentic when we do. Are other reasons in, in our society to, that makes us feel inadequate? And I can, sure, you can name a lot, and just a few came to my mind, and one is technology and the race of technology where many of us, especially those of us who are older, don't feel adequate, and we're trying like crazy to get in there and be adequate, but we don't feel that we're good enough, like it's not good enough to be me. And another one, I think, is the um, superabundance in our society. There is so much. What do we choose? And maybe you have two of those, two computers, two cars, two whatever, and I only have one. And that's another reason we might not feel adequate or quite up to par. Um, I thought of another one, and that is the, I'd say, national epidemic of self-promotion. In our society, self-promotion is really, really become important. Selfies, as they talk about these little videos really important, and those, some of us really don't feel comfortable doing that, and nobody can feel really comfortable promoting themselves all the time with this confident, ebullient, outgoing personality because no one feels confident all of the time. So there is a sense and a way in which we can really feel inadequate with that self-promotion. Um, we can end up feeling like we're pretending when we kind of promote ourselves in that way. And then another one, and as I said, I'm sure you have a lot, but aging. You know, we are a society that is devoted to perpetual youth, right? Eternal youth is supposed to be the, the focus. So I read a story not too long ago about Kim Novak. I don't know if anybody here, maybe there's some of you who remember Kim Novak. Maybe there are many of you who don't even have a clue. Kim Novak was an actress who was very popular in the... 50s and the 60s, and on um, uh, on the night of the Academy Awards, she co-hosted the Academy Awards. She's 81 now, and during and while she was co-hosting, I read it according to a report, uh, Donald Trump, who, who in his kind of nasty way tweeted, she ought to sue her um, cosmetic her. Yep. Plastic surgeon, thank you, that she should sue her plastic surgeon because she's evidently spent a great deal of time and money um, with to create a face that looks young. I mean, the point is, Kim Novak is trying to look like Kim Novak, and she no longer does. So she commented that his comment, and by a few other people who criticized her for her unnatural youthful looks, that she felt bullied. She said she went home and she stayed home, was, didn't even want to go outside. She said she understands what teens feel like, many teens, when they're bullied. That's how she felt about it. And what I observed, or we can observe, I think, is that she is as much into, was, has been as much into looking young and whatever it takes to look young 
it's a pool that we can understand. We all have the ways that we're trying to fit in. And she has seen the reverse side of it. She's no longer young. You know, I, heard, I was talking to someone not too long ago, she, an older woman, she said she lived in what she called the Kim Novak era. And because she didn't li- look like Kim, she always felt ugly. Yeah. So now even Kim doesn't look like Kim. And so it goes, ever-changing, ever-changing. And I would say, uh, these are several reasons and ways we're called to fit in. There's another area that I wanted to talk about, and that is in spiritual practice. Spiritual practice is a practice, we, as we know, in which we are learning to grow as people, becoming more aware, aware of ourselves, how we react, aware of these universal truths in which we live. And yet, if you're into inadequacy, if it's big for you, you can even find reasons in spiritual practice to feel inadequate. And maybe you've experienced some of them. For example, if you walk into a big room and everybody is meditating, has that ever, have you ever thought that, wow, everybody is sitting here and they've got quiet minds and our minds running around like crazy. I'm not a good meditator. I've thought of that at times. Or what about if any of you have ever been to maybe a Buddhist temple or a monastery? Sometimes there's a big Buddha sitting up there. I mean, multiple times life size. I was at, at Bhavana for some time, and there's a huge Buddha up behind where the teacher's sitting. Everybody's looking at it. You can feel really inadequate, so small looking at this enormous statue. Or you can be listening to a teacher, and you know, I'm not getting what they're talking about. Maybe sometimes that's happened for you, inadequacy, or like, it's not good enough. You know, I'm I'm not good enough to do this. And I'll even say, I think there's a way that our teaching can make us feel inadequate too. I mean, we've got the list, the five um, hindrances, you know, Greed are aversion and doubt and worry and what was the other one? I missed one. Sloth and tarper. Thank you, friends. Five hindrances. And most of us have all of them. And we have them in big, big time. And, you know, we're working hard. We're working hard to overcome them. And then we backslide. It's like, uh uh-oh, you know, I'm not a good practitioner. And it's not just the five hindrances that are the three poisons and the four noble truths, and you've heard a lot of them. It's so easy. Everything changes. There's never just this easy progression to getting better and better. You can really feel inadequate. And I think there's another way you can feel inadequate, and I think it's one of the biggest ones, and that is you can start comparing your spiritual experiences, or lack of, with others. And it's like, oh, Lord, whatever yours are, you can look at someone else and feel really puny. Like, you know, what have I learned? Where have I been? So for all these reasons, I think that spiritual practice, if you are, um, can make us feel inadequate too. I'm not saying it should. But once we start comparing, any comparison, uh, that's what happens. Uh, comparing mind, it can be devastating. It is devastating. Um, The Buddha taught, don't hang on to what he called views. Basically, he was speaking often in terms of different ideologies. But it can be any views. You comparing yourself with someone else. Here's another, here's a quote that uh, one teacher, his name is Gil Fronsdale, said, And he said, to be at peace, one must let go of all clinging. And then he quotes the Buddha here, and he said, one who is attached gets into disputes over doctrines. But how and with what would one dispute when when someone is unattached? By not embracing or rejecting anything, a person has shaken off every view right here. Not to be attached, 
What does that mean? It can be so perplexing when we hear don't be attached. What? Don't love? Don't do anything? No, we do whatever we do. And yet we know, you know, right now it serves and right, it may, may not serve tomorrow. Not to hold on, not to grasp. Someone else has their own views. It's okay. Their views are their views. But the second we go into opposition, we're resisting. We're attaching. Resistance is attachment, you see, right? Do you see that? Resisting is attachment too. Attachment isn't just going to, it can be going away. So the Buddha is saying, just be present. Then when you're present, there's peace. You can live in harmony. He's not saying don't love. He's not saying don't act. It can be really confusing there. He is saying, don't compare. Comparing mind. Now, let us say, to say don't compare is simple. I'm saying it here. Simple, don't compare, and yet we do it. I think the way is eased a lot about this don't compare. If we really, truly know deep down that it's okay to be you, whoever you are, young, old, introvert, extrovert, you like this, you don't like it. All of it is fine. You're not inadequate. You're not a walking mistake. Neither am I. None of us are. We tend to sometimes think so, like the world has it out, the universe has it out for us. You're not. You're just you. And isn't that wonderful to be you? And all your you-ness of who you are. So the idea is to learn you matter whoever you are, because you're alive. Just as you are yourself. We need to really have faith in our basic rightness. That's the place, the authentic place where our spiritual path begins. As long as we're being a little bit phony and trying to be someone else, someone we maybe we admire or who has a lot of a spiritual this, that, or the other, you're not being you. Whatever you are, whatever state you're in, that's you. Being real with what you are, with what you are. So I'm going to read part of a poem that I know many, many of you have heard before, perhaps several times. But I'd like to just ask you to close your eyes and let the words resonate. It never grows irrelevant, and it's by the poet Gawe Cannell from his poem, St. Francis and the Sow. And he says, the bud stands for all things, even those things that don't flower. For everything flowers from within of self-blessing. Though sometimes it's necessary to reteach a thing its loveliness, to put a hand on the brow of the flower and retell it in words and in touch, it is lovely until it flowers again from within of self-blessing. Blessing yourself. The breath of love that we did earlier, self-blessing, just as you are. So if you wish, you can continue to keep your eyes closed or open as you prefer. But I'd like to say that while many people never question, even look at who they are, they're not really conscious of it, we as meditators do. We're constantly really searching, not just in a personal way, but looking to see what is it we're doing to become conscious, to become conscious. And that's why I think it's a real pull to try to be other than what we are. So in this context, I thought of a story that comes from the Jewish tradition and it's a story about a young man whose name was David. And David was studying to be a rabbi, according to the story. And one of his heroes, models, was Moses. And he was trying to model himself after this great spiritual being. He was trying to do that, and yet his teacher became very concerned about David. And his teacher was concerned because his young student never thought that he was good enough. He was not a spark, spark of what Moses was. 
It just felt inadequate. I mean, Moses, in a sense, the figure of Moses was intimidating him. So the rabbi called to him one day, and he said, you know, David, he said, when the, day, when the day of judgment arrives and you stand before God, God is not going to ask you, why were you not Moses? He'll ask you, why were you not David? I think that's a wonderful lesson for each one of us. Why are you not you? Why is Susan not Susan or John not John or Roger not Roger? Hmm? Why, are not, why are we not we? Why are you not you? Blessing yourself and knowing you, wherever you are, whatever you are, whatever you think about your personality, you are fine. You are all you need to be, and this is the place in which you need to stand just what you are, in all its truth. I think we, we begin to appreciate that more and more when we realize how precious every moment in our life is. It is so brief. It's too important for us to hide behind a false identity to know that we're okay. We're okay. Once we try to hide behind a false identity, and of course, I mentioned at the outset being a cheerleader, and it was, in a sense, a false identity. Okay, teens do that, but so do we as adults do that all the time, whether we're adults or we're teens. Uh, when we pretend, we're not, being, we're not being ourselves. So I ask, where are places in your life where you're hiding behind or wishing you were something other than what you are? Maybe younger, maybe more outgoing, maybe more quiet, maybe more whatever, wealthier, uh, a better whatever you are at your profession. Where, where in your life are you pretending? And where, with those, with yourself and those who are close to you, are you not telling the truth? Hmm? Where are you not speaking up? Because that's a form of pretending, isn't it? Not speaking up been saying who it is or what it is you are, what you need, not in a brutal way, but in a kind way, if you can, a wise way, a loving way, but being truthful. That's what Vipassana, our practice is, to see things as they truly are. That's the first step, to articulate what you see when you're called to articulate it, right? Here's a quote from uh, the author Paul Farini in a book called The Silence of the Heart. And he said, it comes down to one question. How honest are you willing to be? Are you willing to be with your feelings and tell the truth to yourself? Are you willing to be with your feelings and tell the truth to your partner? Do you want to inhabit your life fully or do you want to give yourself away? If you answer honestly, you will know clearly where you stand in your relationships. As long as you have something to hide, there will be, de be deceit operating in your psyche. There is a part of you that is missing in action. Where did it go? And who are you without it? All masks must be peeled away. If we are to stand face to face with ourselves and each other, until then, this is just a carnival, a public dance ritual, the meaning of which has been forgotten. Stop chasing pleasure and avoiding pain. Stand up inside of yourself. Be visible, be visible, be vulnerable, and tell the truth. These are really strong words. Strong, strong words. And again, it's not about being brutally true but it has been finding kind ways of expressing what is true for you, what is true for you. Now staying what is true for any of us is really tricky because first of all, truth changes, everything changes. How do we stay with ourselves in a flexible, kind way and there's only one answer and it's being mindful, being to tie in with your heart and, and mind and to know what's really going on for you and expressing as kindly and as clearly as you can. Once 
we really make the effort to tie in to who we are. And it's an ongoing effort. It's not like you got it today and you got it forever. You know, it doesn't stop. The effort is ongoing. Once you've tied into that, then there's another level that we need to notice. We're trying to recognize and be true, authentic with who we are. And then the next level on the spiritual path is to recognize what you are. Because each of us is not only a who, we are a what. We are a something beyond our personal self, our personal identity, as difficult as that is, as challenging as that is to be with it all the time. There is this other level. If we are to truly be present and working on our spiritual practice, we begin, it begins to dawn on us, whoa, there's something else there. And that something else is bears on what we are. What we truly are, and I will say in a primordial sense, beneath all the layers of who we are, beneath our roles, there's something else that is there. I'm going to quote right now from Zen master Dogen. Dogen Zenji, he was a Zen master Japanese in the 12th century or was it 13th century. He wrote a lot. Zen people read his writings like we in our tradition read the writings of the Buddha. You read Dogen. So there is amongst his writings, something he called Rules for Meditation. And I, for a while, a couple of years, lived in a Zen monastery, and we recited Rules for Meditation every single day. And I'm going to read just a few lines for his Rules for Meditation. And he said, um, It is futile to travel to other dusty countries, thus forsaking your own seat. If your first step is false, you will immediately stumble. Already you are in possession of the vital attributes of a human being. Do not waste time with this and that. You can possess the authority of Buddha. This is Dogen. He said, don't forsake your own seat. In the context of our talk right now, be yourself. Don't rely on on false identities. Don't go grasping after them. Realize the importance of just being who you are, where you are. And then he said, already you are in the uh, possession of the vital attributes of a human being. Uh, What does that mean? Well, at very bottom, you don't need to change anything. You don't need, as Jack Kornfield said, you don't need a personality transplant. It's fine who you are. He went on to say, don't waste time with this and that because you can possess the authority of the Buddha. The truth is, the reason why he could say that is because we already have the basic qualities that the Buddha had. This is the, part, this is the what. We are and have the same nature that the Buddha has. In the other Buddhist traditions, They make this clear. They call it bodhicitta. And it is just this basic quality of heart and mind that goes beneath and below our uh, roles. All the ways we identify ourselves and all of our uncertainties and hesitancies, there's something else below it. That's the what. That's the what that we are. And mystics have always known it. Hmm? Mystics have always known that we possess that. You know, in the Sufi tradition, there are some Sufis that say, I am God. I don't mean any vast God, but an expression of God. Don't we all know that? We each have that which is sacred within us. We're an expression of that. And in the Buddhist tradition, we can call it Buddha nature, our bodhicitta. We've heard cosmic consciousness. There are many, many names, and the words don't matter. It's the getting in touch with that primordial reality, essence, within. I mean, I'm saying a lot of words here. Finding it, getting in touch with it, getting in touch with it. 
So Meister Eckhart, a mystic, 13th century German mystic, he said, the eye with which I see God is the eye with, with which God sees me. Same thing. That's, that's it. The eye with which I see God is the eye with which God sees me. Doesn't make sense, right? Not to the mind. But on this other level, to the heart, if you stop and let it resonate, I think it will make sense. It does make sense because there's something inside that does know that. Mm. And I want to quote here a, an Indian master. His name is Nisargadatta. He's saying quite the same thing. And I'm saying these in different ways because maybe some of it will resonate more. Mr. Gadatta lived in the 20th century. I didn't, I, he died, I guess, in the 1980s, I think. Maybe the 90s, but I think it was the 80s. He said, you cannot possibly say that you are what you think yourself to be. Your ideas about yourself change from day to day and from moment to moment. Your self-image is the most changeable thing you have. It's all utterly vulnerable at the mercy of a passerby, a bereavement, the loss of a job, an insult, your image of yourself, which you call your person, changes deeply. To know what you are, you first must vest investigate and know what you are not. And to know that what you are not, you must watch yourself carefully, rejecting all that does not necessarily go with the basic fact I am. The idea is that I'm born at a given place at a given time for my parents and now I am so and so living at such and such, married to, father of, employed by and so on, are not intrinsic, inherent in any sense. Our usual attitude is, I am this. Separate consistently and persevering, I am, from I am this or I am that. And try to feel what it means to just be. I am, just be, without being this or without being that. That being is what you are, feeling it. And it's right there, you know, we, our minds get in the way, but in fact, our whole practice is devoted eventually to getting past, to clearing up all those things we think ourselves to be, all those stumbling blocks, and simply just being. So I guess in closing I would say that I think the real message is we don't need to worry about feeling inadequate, like we're not good enough, like we're not being authentic, because at this other level all we need to do is be and keep remembering just being. So I thank you for listening. Are there any comments? I've just talked a lot. <laughs> Anybody else would like to say something? Yes. And please speak up. Yeah. To compare is to despair. Exactly. Comparing mind, it's suffering. And as she's quoting uh, Swami Satchitananda, it's not like, I mean, this is known by every, all practitioners who go deeply into whatever tradition. It's, it's not just that we're teaching Buddhism here. We're talking, looking at really what's true. Really looking. Thanks. Anybody else? Yes. Sure. <laughs> Maybe good for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, you didn't miss much. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Cynthia. Yes, Linda. Well, 
isn't is it not all societies have that this pull to conform to whatever the societal we're just we're social beings and we also have that sense of something deeper than what society says we have both it's a conflict isn't it? art can be a real conflict and that's what we're struggling with. What is the societal norms or what is out there? It's not the societal norms. And what do we feel deeply in here? And what we're learning in our, on our path is how do we express and embody that? We're all just groping around trying to figure it out, you know, kind of stumbling here and there. But it's authentic. I mean, it's real that we're really trying. Yeah. Yes. You're very welcome. Can you speak up? 